only lost my coach. I also lost all the role models that I would have had to look up to. This is the story of how America came back. Two women spinning talent into gold. I wanted to be the best. Their struggles to be effortless. She was elegant. You know, I was a truck driver. I was not delicate. Moments of doubt. I was thrilled to be the champion, but in my heart, I knew that I really didn't deserve it. And glory. That feeling of accomplishment has really stayed with me forever. Tonight, Icons of the Ice, a Dateline Olympics special, Peggy and Dorothy. From our studios in Rockefeller Center, here is Stone Phillips. Good evening. For one last night, the flame still burns. And beneath it, they're gathering for a grand finale to the 2002 Olympic Games. The crowd in Salt Lake City expected to be some 50,000 strong. Athletes and spectators from around the world brought together by competition and at times divided by controversy are united tonight, counting down to the closing ceremony just one hour away. Over the past two weeks, we've seen Team USA carry off an unprecedented 34 medals, including today's silver in men's ice hockey. So many new champions with fascinating stories. But tonight, the stories you haven't heard about two all-time Olympic favorites, skating legends Peggy Fleming and Dorothy Hamill. A very personal look when we come back. Welcome back. It is the centerpiece of the Winter Games. In fact, year-round, the only sport that's more popular on TV than figure skating is football. Ask a young figure skater today who first fired her dream of glory on the ice, and chances are you'll hear two names, Peggy and Dorothy. Superb artistry and athleticism made Peggy Fleming and Dorothy Hamill stars, but something else made them icons, as you're about to see. Tonight from our colleagues at NBC Sports, an extraordinary look at two of America's most loved Olympic champions and some things about them you may never have known. Their stories are even more remarkable when you consider that 41 years ago this month, American figure skating was virtually wiped out when the nation's top skaters and their coaches were killed in a plane crash. As Jim McKay tells us, it was a tragedy that reached all the way to the White House. With me is Mr. Ted Kennedy, the brother of our president, John F. Kennedy, who has a message for us. Ted? It's a uh, message from the president, the uh, generous memorial tribute to the brilliant skaters and teachers of skating who lost their lives in Brussels will help to lay the foundation for a new era of excellence for competitive figure skating in the United States. The losses which were sustained in the Brussels tragedy are irreparable. On February 15, 1961, Sabina Airlines Flight 548 from New York crashed near Brussels, Belgium. There were no survivors. 18 members of the U.S. figure skating team and six coaches perished on their way to the World Championships in Prague. Young and full of promise, they were determined to extend an era of unmatched success. Since 1948, the U.S. had won six of the eight gold medals in Olympic singles events. Remarkably, the two best women skaters in this new generation were from one family, Maribel and Laurence Owen, both national champions. Maribel in pairs and Laurence just 16 in singles. They were coached by their mother, nine-time U.S. ladies champion Maribel Vincent Owen. In shock from the catastrophic crash, figure skating canceled the Prague Championships as word of the sudden stunning loss rippled through the skating world, reaching an unknown 12-year-old from California who had learned to skate barely three years before. Well, I first heard about the 61 crash from my mother. She told me before I was going to go to school that day that the plane had crashed and all the skaters were killed. It was a devastating loss for the U.S. skating team to be you know, wiped out at that level. Um, 
I not only lost my coach, and uh, I also lost all the role models that I would have had to look up to to emulate. And you know that was um, devastating to the U.S. Experts said it would take more than a decade for America to rebuild its skating program and produce athletes who could again be competitive at the Olympic level. like a prima ballerina because you would twirl around do the twirl test with our skirts and you see the little skirt ruffling like that in the breeze and that's like a big music box and hopefully you don't fall over when you spin around and it makes you imagine that you're pretty <laughs> I never thought of myself as being beautiful, but when I got on the ice, I felt something inside of me that made me feel real special and strong and pretty and, and very sensitive. And I think it was a wonderful tool for me at an early age to, to kind of find myself. growing up on the farm and you know the freedom of you know running in the hills because we had like 10 acres and you know I just felt like we had the world there you know living off the land sort of um, and we had cows and pigs and chickens and rabbits and had a vegetable garden we made our own butter we made our ice cream we did everything Doris and Al Fleming, newly wed and ready to raise a family, settled in California's Santa Cruz Mountains. Peggy was the second of their four daughters. Doris ran the household, making the children's clothing as the family survived on her husband's modest income. Al, a World War II Marine, shared his passion for sports with his girls, taking Peggy skating for the first time when she was nine. My dad stayed involved with my skating um, in the respect of taking me to the skating rinks early in the morning because he worked the night shift. So he would be coming home from work. He was a newspaper pressman and he would be coming home from work at like 6 a.m. and we would just be getting up and he, you know, have breakfast with me or whatever and, and take me to the skating rink and uh, then eventually he ended up making the ice, driving the Zamboni and cleaning the ice for me to practice on uh, before school. The extra work at the rink helped offset the cost of skating lessons, which Al could not afford on his $200 a week salary at the presses. But despite their unsettled finances, he found a way to nurture Peggy's talent as she found herself on the ice. <laughs> I remember as a kid, you know, sort of sliding on our rear ends down the hill to the pond and grabbing whatever skates were around. Of course, they were too big, so I stuffed socks in the toes. Even though I couldn't really skate at that point, I, I just remember loving the feeling of freedom on the ice. Dorothy Hamill was seven years old when she first laced up a pair of battered hand-me-down skates, already broken in by her brother Sandy and sister Marcia. She would have to wait nearly a year for a new pair. Plastic skates with red trim that arrived in the Hamill's Riverside, Connecticut home on Christmas morning. As Dorothy's talent emerged, she began to spend more time on the ice, often at the expense of the typical backyard fun enjoyed by the kids around the neighborhood. And I do remember sort of resenting a little bit, having to go to bed very early because I had to get up 
and go ice skating and feeling very much like, gosh, I'm not sure I want to do this. You know, I want to be out there playing with them. Instead, it was in bed by seven, rise and shine by five. Then the bleary-eyed commute, typically a two-hour round trip, five days a week. A considerable commitment, not just for Dorothy, but also for her mother, Carol. More than once, Dorothy wanted to quit. But in those restless early mornings, it was mom who persevered. I remember her saying at five o'clock in the morning, pitch dark and I would be down the hall and I'd hear her say, I've paid for the lesson and you are committed to continue until the lessons are not paid for anymore. I had no idea what it involved. We had to drive quite a distance. Some afternoons we'd go over to Low Tour, which was a good hour trip from where we lived, just to get some ice sk skating time. And she'd play the music so loud. <laughs> My poor mother, <laughs> she'd hear these songs over and over, and it was day in and day out, and there was no relief. And it was so loud. And Dorothy fell asleep, and I'd turn the radio down. <laughs> you know, when I think back, it must have just driven her nuts. Gosh, you know, at four in the morning. <sighs> She was pretty patient. My mother wasn't the image of what her mother wanted her to be. And I think when she saw that little spark of talent in me, it was like, hmm. You know, my mother always wanted me to do that, and I think my daughter has that. And she um, encouraged me and maybe pushed me at times, but sometimes you do need to push a child. Doris Fleming, as motivating mother and ultimate decision maker, led Peggy to an unexpected national title as a 15-year-old in 1964. And when Peggy finished sixth at the Innsbruck Olympics, she realized for the first time she could compete with the world's best. But to take the next step, she needed to improve her compulsory figures. The precise tracing of patterns on the ice, in those days 60% of a skater's score. When Doris identified a coach who could help, former European champion Carlo Fossi, the Flemings took a drastic and uncommon step. Well, Carl and I, we were just flabbergasted that, that a whole family would pick up from California and come to move to Colorado Springs but they did that within I think they decided to come and in one week Peggy was there and two weeks later the whole family was there they had to find a new home a new job for Al and new schools for the girls also Peggy could train with Fosse at the renowned Broadmoor World Arena one constant remained Doris's ever watchful eye and steady presence when Peggy was on the ice. I always um, would procrastinate about getting out there to the practice session and my mother would be up there sitting in the stands and you know she'd be looking at her watch going okay the practice is going to start in five minutes where's Peggy where's Peggy and you could see that Doris was starting to get nervous. Um, after two minutes passed Doris would get up and start to walk to the end of the arena. And she'd just be getting out of her chair to come back into the dressing room and yell at me to get out there. And I would just come out like 30 seconds before, you know, I was supposed to be out there. And I'd walk out, what, mom, what, what, what's the matter? <laughs> and it's like Peggy had an antenna in her head or something. Just as Doris would make the corner to go into the locker room, out she came, walk on the ice, very nonchalant like this, start to skate, smile at everybody, and her mother, turn around and get back into her chair. <laughs> it was every day the same thing. It was very funny. I 
loved you know having everybody look at me that I was the best one out there on the ice and I guess that was my early feeling of what competition was about because I wanted to be the best at every practice session even if it was a public session I wanted everyone to look at me as her femininity blossomed on the ice Peggy inevitably drew the attention of the young men around her at 17, she began to date Greg Jenkins, a 20-year-old ice dancer who also trained under Fossey. Doris, ever protective of Peggy's career, feared a boyfriend would be nothing more than a distraction. And at the 1966 Worlds in Davos, Switzerland, with Peggy on the verge of her first championship, Doris found her daughter's attention divided. He was writing letters to me like every day. He was always really good at that. And I remember before the championship, my mother just got so upset with me because I was spending so much time writing these letters. And she goes, she you know, saw me sitting at the desk and she came and she picked up the letter and ripped it up and ripped up all the pictures. She says, you're wasting too much time on this. You're, you should be focusing on the world championships. And I'm like, oh, mother, how could you? How could you do this? And I'm like, you know, crying my eyes out. But, you know, she really did know how to get my attention. And and, you know, I really was kind of daydreaming and maybe she hadn't done that. Maybe I wouldn't have had that competitiveness to win that championship. In just half the time the experts predicted, five years after the Brussels tragedy, Peggy Fleming won the first of her three straight world titles. The victory meant an unexpected tour through Europe. But having already committed to skate an exhibition in Boston, she briefly left the circuit to fulfill her obligation. Her father made a special cross-country trip, a rare opportunity for Al Fleming to see his daughter perform. I picked Ave Maria um, basically because it was one of my father's favorite pieces. Um, he was raised as a Catholic and you know he always wanted to have his girls be just the pure as the driven snow <laughs> so I thought well that would be a, a wonderful number to do as an exhibition number and um, my father came to watch that performance and he was so proud to see me skate and you know I was so proud to be able to do that for him that was the last time they saw each other after the show, Peggy rejoined her mother and the tour which had reached the Soviet Union. Al began the long drive back to Colorado. While in Cleveland, he suffered a heart attack and died. He was 41 years old. You know, we were ready to board a plane with a big tour group uh, of skaters. And somebody from the embassy came up to my mother and took us aside and told us. And I just, it was just so devastating and to be in such a public place I mean it was just you couldn't go any place private you know I didn't cry really let it all out until I got on the airplane and went in the bathroom and cried by myself and... it's still hard <laughs> but at least he got to see me skate The most exhilarating moment of Peggy's life was shattered by the most devastating. That same month, Dorothy Hamill's father took his nine-year-old daughter to her very first competition. very first competition. It was in the springtime. It was probably 70 degrees outside and the ice was soaking wet. And I was competing against all these little girls that had these perfect little dresses and they had competed many times before. And I completely felt like an outsider. I knew none of the names of these girls. I just remember being in awe of their beautiful dresses and their music and their choreography and really feeling sort of like you know I was placed into this scene that I didn't you know what's wrong with this picture and it was me 
It was April 1966. Chalmers Hamill took his youngest daughter to the Walnut Open in New York Central Park. And to the surprise of everyone, especially Dorothy, she finished in second place. I do remember my father, you know, being very proud. And it was the first time I remember him keeping scores and, you know, writing a little notebook. And that was when I really realized that my father was very interested in his little girl. dad. Well, he wanted us to just be real simple. No stockings, no makeup, and you know, don't tease your hair and spray it. So everything was just real simple. Peggy was not allowed to wear makeup, and I had to call her father. Doris wasn't even allowed to give permission for that. I had to call her father at 15, which was young at that age, to just allow a little eyeliner or mascara or something. And I remember standing at the ice rink on the payphone and saying, could we just put a little on? Bob Paul, master choreographer, had been brought on to polish Peggy's style, complimenting Carlo Fassi, the technical perfectionist. Paul took the teenage skater to ballets and operas, exposing her to new forms of beauty and expression, which she readily absorbed and naturally implemented. I love the movement of dance and that effortless, uh, you know, wispiness of a, of a ballet dancer and, and the emotion from the opera. I mean, all of those things really did add to, um, I think, the, the overall feeling that I had for my skating. I saw Peggy skate and she was thin, she was elegant, she was just, you know, so... Um, so fluid and so lovely, just delicate, that there, you know, I was a truck driver. I was not delicate. There's nothing delicate about me. So, you know, while I could look longingly and admire that, I knew that that just, you know, don't even, don't even think about it, you know? The more Dorothy practiced, the less self-assured she became. She spent the summer of 66 in Lake Placid, and while preparing for her second competition, she overheard her coach tell her parents that though she was a fine technical skater, she lacked a certain grace. It was sort of a small step to me realizing that I was, I was gonna have to be something other than graceful. I'm just gonna have to, you know, jump higher and spin faster and skate faster and with more power than the other girls because that's what I could do and I was able to do. And that, that was what I had that they didn't have. And um, I guess that's when the, the real competitiveness in me came out. She was more determined than ever to be the best. And in January 1968, she was exposed to the best. From the Broadmoor Skating Club of Colorado Springs, Miss Peggy Gale Fleming. Christmas, Dorothy's parents gave her tickets to the national championships in Philadelphia, which would determine the Olympic team for the games in Grenoble. Peggy, and perhaps her finest performance, won her fifth straight title. When we arrived in Grenoble, she was a celebrity pretty much from the beginning. The French loved her. You know, her refined skating and her refined manner um, really made people like her from the very beginning. Though Peggy was an instant celebrity and overwhelming favorite in France, Doris was still determined to give her every edge. While researching the small alpine villages surrounding Grenoble, she found inspiration, a theme for her daughter's Olympic program, right down to the chartreuse green color of her dress. She had this real deep thought that it would really endear me to the uh, French people if I wore this color because of this well-known liqueur that was made in um, Chartreuse, uh, France. And so I don't think the audience really got that. <laughs> what the audience did get in France and back home was that Peggy Fleming was different. Her style and sensuality projecting into America's living rooms. 
including that of her boyfriend and future husband, Greg Jenkins, whose family bought their first color television set just to watch Peggy skate in Grenoble. It all seemed to go by, you know, pretty fast and uh, in a, in a nerve-wracking sort of way. I think Peggy called me within an hour or two after, after she had won. And I guess in a sense it did seem a bit unreal. There my girlfriend was, you know, winning the Olympics. Peggy Fleming was America's only gold medalist in Grenoble. And in the flush of victory, she didn't realize how completely her life was about to change. She was the perfect star at the right time. A moment when sport, especially the Olympics, was merging with big-time entertainment. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, age of Aquarius. Hi, I'm Peggy Fleming, and I'd like you to join me here in my show. In <laughs> For the first time, an American Olympian stepped out of the games into television stardom. Not as an athlete, but as an entertainer. Peggy connected with producer Bob Banner for four television specials shot across the globe. This was uncharted territory, and no one knew if it would work. Hi, I'm Peggy Fleming, and I'd like you to be... That was my first job. I hadn't even babysat before. <laughs> I didn't have... I never got paid to do anything except the hour television special when I was 19 years old. <laughs> it's a big jump. You know, just jump right in, you know, with two feet. Okay, you lead. In her very first show, Peggy was paired with one of Hollywood's leading entertainers, Gene Kelly. You know, I haven't done this for 25 years. 25 years? I wasn't even born yet. Shut up and skate. Peg of my heart, I love you. Don't let us part. Instead of, you know, skating in arenas and, and uh, ice rinks, I was skating at the MGM studio lots in Hollywood. I mean, I felt like a total movie star. And instead of my mother making my costumes, I had Bob Mackie making my costumes. But my mother was there on every fitting to make sure that nothing was showing too much and, and that the skirt line was not too high and everything was very conservative. So um, Bob Mackie even got a taste of what it was like to be around my mother. <laughs> Like Doris Fleming, Carol Hamill knew that for her daughter to reach her full potential, she needed a coach to instill discipline and sharpen her compulsory figures. Like Doris, she turned to Carlo Fossi, whose reputation had soared with Peggy's success. The Hamills made the difficult decision to split the family, Dorothy and her mother moving 2,000 miles away from home to train with Fossi in Colorado. My mother and I fell in love with Carlo immediately. He had the most wonderful sense of humor. He was obviously a genius when it came to teaching school figures, and that was something that I really needed help with. He was tough on her, and he treated her like one of his own kids. So you have to be strict. The disciplined approach paid dividends on the ice, including national championships in 1974 and 1975. But as the 76 Olympics approached, their relationship became increasingly strained. The 18-year-old skater chafing under Fossey's exacting program. The old world coach disenchanted by Dorothy's teenage typical mood swings. Carla and I were not having the best relationship because I was a teenager and I was a pain in the neck. And he <laughs> didn't want to, you know, he just didn't need that, you know. And so it was, it was a tough, it was a tough year. I skated, um, 
at the Nationals and won. So I was thrilled to be the champion, but in my heart I knew that I really didn't deserve it. I wasn't in the best shape. Um, you know, I hadn't really trained as well as I should have. And it showed in my performance. Just weeks before the Innsbruck Games, everything was falling apart. Dorothy's always fragile confidence was nearly shattered when Fosse left Colorado to train Britain's John Curry, his hopeful for the men's title. My mother and I were horrified, thinking, oh gosh, now what do we do? And because it was a bit of a surprise. My mother packed up this apartment that we'd had for three years, you know, in 24 hours. And we left Denver. I mean, that was it. We were gone. And it was the strangest. It was so strange. At the time, it was almost unheard of. A top contender for the ladies' gold, suddenly without her coach, so close to the games. The Hamels had little choice but to head back east toward home. Dorothy, wondering all the way if this Olympic opportunity, surely her last, was beginning to slip away. Dorothy Hamill arrived in Innsbruck on the eve of the 76 games with renewed focus and in the best physical shape of her career. Back home, she had reconnected with one of her former coaches, Peter Burroughs. Dorothy was close to a state of panic, but Burroughs steadied her nerves and improved her conditioning during intense five-hour practice sessions. Though newly motivated when she rejoined Fosse across the Atlantic, Dorothy still lacked the confidence of a gold medal favorite. She had never won a world title to prove that she was the best in the eyes of the judges. Dorothy Hamill was a But once on Olympic ice, her difficulties seemed to melt away, and she held the lead after the short program. Now, on the verge of Olympic gold, Dorothy faced more pressure than ever before and had a day off before the long program to think about it. My mom said, let's, let's get out of town. Let's go someplace. And being the big fan of Sound of Music, um, the mom decided that we'd go to Salzburg. It was a day of relaxation and fun and taking Dorothy's mind off the fact that she had a big job to do the next day. <laughs> And I remember going into the church and lighting a candle and uh, my sister and I were there and we shared a special little moment. And we both started to cry and it was, it was great. The sojourn in Salzburg provided Dorothy with a much needed reprieve from the stress of competition. But reality awaited her back in the Olympic Village. While she was away, stacks of well-wishing telegrams piled up in her room. And as she opened each one, she found a reminder in print of what was at stake. I don't know who this is. I'll, I'll ask mom tomorrow. She'll know. Open the second one. Hmm, I don't remember this person either. Oh, okay, that's the stack. I'll ask mom tomorrow. Then, oh yes, I know this one. And then after going through, you know, at least 20, realizing that I've never met these people. They're just well-wishers. And at that point, I felt so completely alone and isolated and, and sort of the magnitude of, I'm not just competing for me here, I'm competing for my country. Even though you know you are, and you feel very proud to represent your country, um, all of a sudden thinking, oh gosh, these people are all expecting me to win. On Friday, February 13th, 1976, Dorothy did win the Olympic gold medal, capturing the long program with an array of five nines, a unanimous first place on all nine judges' cards.
Back in the States, she discovered, like Peggy Fleming before her, that life would never be the same. Her seemingly simple haircut had become a fashion phenomenon, and she had earned something, a status, that could never be lost. And that few could comprehend. Except, of course, those who had been there. I think what the Olympic title gave me was um, a respect. You know, I could go in any ice show or be on any television show, and people respected me. Not just of how you looked, but what you accomplished. And that feeling of accomplishment has really stayed with me forever. I mean, that, that never has gone away. Peggy Fleming's Olympic title was unthinkable when the future of elite figure skating in the U.S. was snuffed out in the frosted fields of Belgium seven years earlier. Fleming, followed by Dorothy Hamill, re-established figure skating in America and sent it soaring to unprecedented popularity. They were the pioneers of professional skating, which at times was, well, it was overwhelming for women so young. Things are so different now that for us, for Peggy and I, it was sort of trial by error. You know, you've, you've led your whole life completely sheltered. You know, everything was done for me. And all of a sudden you're sort of thrown into this world with, you know, agents and managers and commercials and this and that and lawyers and accountants and, um, you know, I never had to worry about anything before. And then you're expected to skate this Olympic performance 13 shows a week without the training and without the sleep, you know, and giving interviews. And it was just, it was miserable. It was truly miserable. Dorothy's post-Olympic life has often been difficult. Two divorces, bankruptcy. But through it all, she relied on the simple solace of skating. Alone on the ice, the prima ballerina of her childhood fancy. I still love it. I mean, I really love it. It's not about the jumping and the spinning. It's about the movement and, and you know, just what I fell in love with in the beginning, you know, on the pond. Now 45 years old, she still skates for two hours every day. It gets harder. Physically, it just gets harder. But, you know, it's still my therapy. I still go to get away from the telephones and go to the rink and work out the cobwebs and, you know, put on whatever kind of music I want. <laughs> and it's just, it's a freedom. It's an outlet. It's just lots, lots of fun. After nearly 40 years on skates, though, Dorothy will tell you that the defining role of her life is as a single mother raising her 13-year-old daughter, Alex. Motherhood is the greatest thing in the world. It's better than any Olympic gold medal. Truly and truly it is. She's by far the best thing that's ever happened to me. Becoming a mother was just a love that you know, I never knew about. I mean, you don't know until you have your own children of that love. Nobody can tell you how deep it is. You can never experience it until you do it yourself. <laughs> Peggy and Greg, now married for 31 years, have two sons and one grandson, three-year-old Miles. Her primary connection to skating these days is as a television analyst. In January 1998, as she prepared to broadcast the U.S. Championships in Philadelphia, the site of her fifth and final national title, she discovered a lump in her breast. It was cancer. One month later, she had successful surgery, a day shy of 30 years since her golden night in Grenoble. Peggy lost her own mother to cancer in 1992, 
And 10 years later, she's gained much perspective on their relationship. I think if I could tell her now that I was really listening and maybe I didn't let her know that I was listening to all those good things that she was instilling in us, but I really was. I just didn't want to let her know that I was back then. Two women, linked by humble beginnings, dedicated mothers, and a coach who guided them to Olympic gold, sparked the rebirth of figure skating in America. Each with her own style, distinct of each other, and unmatched since. Each winning a place in the hearts of America. A place that remains secure as they remain linked to their sport. Mature in motherhood, stars of yesteryear who haven't just faded away. Dorothy Hamill returns to the ice tonight for the closing ceremony after a bit of a scare. During a rehearsal last night, she skated into an artificial fog, fell and hit her chin and went to the hospital. But she's okay and is set to create some magic for the millions watching tonight. Already preparations are underway for the next Olympics, the Summer Games of 2004 in Athens. And NBC's Brian Williams is there. Stone, thanks. And as the sun sets on another day here in Athens, Greece, that means they have exactly 900 days now to prepare to bring on the world and host the Summer Olympic Games 2004. Will Athens, Greece be ready? They say yes. They remind the world the Olympics were, after all, invented here. Are there problems? Yes, there are, especially having to do with infrastructure. It's one of the world's oldest cities, of course. The ground we're standing on has 3,000 years of history beneath it. So if you dig a hole in Athens, the preservationists are likely to pay a visit to see what's in your shovel, quite literally. A project like that can often instantly become an archaeological dig. On the plus side, they plan to spend more on security than even the Salt Lake Winter Games. It looks like a $6 billion total price tag. They'll be getting advice from the U.S. Secret Service. This won't be a Secret Service show, but they can show the Greeks how to keep everyone here safe. Stone, back to you. Brian Williams in Athens. That's all for this special edition of Dateline Sunday. We'll see you again for Dateline Tuesday at 10, 9 central. Now stay tuned for NBC's coverage of the closing ceremony of the 19th Olympic Winter Games. I'm Stone Phillips, and for all of us at NBC News, good night. is a presentation of NBC News. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world.